friends ladies and gentlemen today is a very proud day for me because i am going to introduce you one of the stalwarts of astrology one of those few people who have learned from the best of the best and this gentleman has been a pioneer in usa to introduce astrology from the guru shishya parampara lineage he has been well known for his accurate world predictions his book is one of my absolute favorites if you if you want to start with the astrology with a great foundation that's his book okay and you would realize when you go through his book it's not any introduction book it's something which contains the juice of more than 43 years of studying vedic astrology well without wasting time let me introduce the one and only james kala james ji namaste welcome to saptarishi's astrology thank you sanya it's nice to be here so when did you start as i remember probably it was 70s early 70s you went into the meditation stream and then i think 75 you met the legendary astrologer sri m k gandhi yeah 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 i i met gandhi in 75 um, i had i had been you know practicing meditation learning meditation studying you know, the vedic tradition uh previous to that uh, but i met gandhi in 75 and then uh, actually later on in uh, 1978 i started assisting him when he would come to the united states and then in 1980 he uh he asked me to become his assistant in london so i would became his full time assistant uh, there in london so how was was he what was his style of teaching i still remember a conversation you and me had uh, nearly a decade back was he just locked you up in a room in bombay and said study <laughs> yes yeah so it's completely the opposite of every teacher that you've ever met who you know sits down and you know even like myself where i sit down i give a class and i'm well organized and i you know give the information in a systematic way and all that uh, he just basically uh brought me to london for you know uh, long enough to get me to kind of learn the calculations of astrology in his office and then he took me to india and he dropped me off in his flat in bombay and uh you know he said read all my books he had a shelf like i've got here in his room you know big hundreds of books and things he said read all my books and then he left and uh he came back like 6 months later and in the meantime uh you know i had you know read all these books on you know just all bb ramans books and i was you know making my horoscope making the horoscopes all my friends and family like everybody does and uh i even predicted my death <laughs> and i wrote him a letter and <laughs> i said uh i now know when i'm going to die i know the exact day i'm going to die <laughs> oh god <laughs> and he came back and he took all the astrology books away from me <laughs> oh my god <laughs> He came back later, but, but anyway. So you that was just that uh, was to just. Uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a guru style, you know. A guru only uh, directs you at one corner, and then observes how you are treating the subject, and then when you go a bit astray, he then comes and controls the situation. So he just, took my he, he took my books away from me three times. you know because i was just getting my head was getting kind of weird you know you know how that happens when you're studying astrology and you become so obsessed with it yeah you know i was i was uh, in bombay one time and i i uh, was in a bookstore just looking for books on astrology just like uh, as an obsession almost like a like a drug fiend you know who is you know looking for his drugs you know and i was looking for my astrology books and um, i saw this woman in there uh, who was also looking for astrology books western woman she was she had this crazed look on her face and i thought to myself that's me 
<laughs> and right after that, he took my books away from me again. Okay. okay. So, uh, coming to M.K. Gandhi, what I hear uh, about him, I, you assisted him in London, where his practice was. Okay. What I hear from a very uh, old astrologer um, is that M.K. Gandhi was so, so popular. And he used to charge uh, phenomenally well. And uh, at the same time, he had very huge clientele among the rich and the famous and even the royal family. Is that true? Or, or, or are we permitted to talk about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, he had lots of famous clients. I don't know about the royal family. I never saw any kings or queens come, come in the door. But uh, he, you know, he did the charts of the Beatles and... Peter Sellers and, you know, Mia Farrow and, you know, I think, uh, and uh, a lot of different, a lot of different uh, movie star types. Mae West at one point, in her chart, and, uh, you know, a lot of old-time movie stars that, uh, but he also did the charts of, you know, spiritual guys as well, you know, like, Connections of various types. He was Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi's astrologer for a period of time. And, okay. Uh, like that. What, 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 what really fascinated you about his predictions or his style of predicting or looking at a chart? Uh, well, it was, he, he was a less is more astrologer. You know, he, he used a minimum of techniques because he didn't need them. You know? Just like uh, Swami Shivananda Murti, who was my teacher after Gandhi died. And uh, even though both of them had studied and knew lots of techniques, Shivananda Murti would just kind of glance at the chart and then he would tell you something. Gandhi basically would, you know, look at the chart and he'd look at the person and then he'd see a flash. And then he'd just, he'd just tell them. And it, was, it, it, had, it had evolved to, you know, mostly intuition. So he wasn't a really technique astrologer and even though I have become a bit of a technique astrologer in the sense you know, that I, I, I consider it actually um, my crutch you know I think that the real astrology is done by those who have the Jyotish Nadis open and those guys don't need a lot of techniques so Gandhi was that was that was what he was about so it was more I was, I was more impressed by the, the deep Deepest intuition that he had, as well as uh, Shivananda Murthy, both of those guys, um, were, were like that. They just had that type of intuition where they could look at you and just tell you everything. Um, but they both also used the horoscope for that purpose. You know, speaking of Shivananda Murthy Ji, Guruji, I, I see his photograph uh, behind you. I think that's him. You know, And uh, thanks due to you, uh, I had the great fortune of meeting him, and uh, even uh, Sri K. N. Rao has mentioned about him in uh, one of his books, Yogi's Destinies, as one of those three realized souls that K. N. Rao met, whose Jyotish Nadi had opened up. So, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, the interesting thing is uh, in the World uh, Mundane Astrology Conference that uh, you and Shivananda Murthy Guruji had organized. I realized that when I met him personally, he, of course, did not see my chart, you know, and he is more of a spiritual, this thing. But he instantly told me which Hindu God I should pray. And I told him, how do you know that's, that he's my favorite God? You know, it was a stupid uh, question from my side. You're speaking to a realized soul and you're asking him, how do you know that Hanuman is my favorite God, you know? so. He was uh, brilliant. I mean, uh, some of his predictions I've heard were absolutely amazing. Those were good old days uh, when I met him. Coming to M.K. Gandhi, any uh, any particular, you said he was not a technique-oriented guy. Did you notice him consistently use, and you said that he used few techniques, but most of the time those techniques were. Would you like to share a technique or two that you feel no, I, that's that's the wrong question with Gandhi because he really I mean I'm I'm seriously telling you he he used 
the Rashi chart, and transits. He hardly ever used him Shotri Dasha. He used it, but he hardly he didn't need it. So he didn't use it much. He used transits mostly. And it, it was that, and then he would use the um, you know the, the transits of Saturn and Jupiter a lot. He'd look at the Dasha and Bhukti, but it, it wasn't like he was uh, you know doing a lot of a lot of techniques. Um, and my experience in with him was really it was a completely different kind of experience, you know. Um, since then, of course, I've sat down with various astrologers and learned, you know, various techniques, uh, how to use divisional charts, how to use, you know, various things. But with Gandhi, it was a different thing. It was a completely different thing. What it was, was being in the environment of possibly the busiest astrology office in the world. I mean, I'm saying that, but I don't think it's an exaggeration. You know, I can only think of one other astrologer, uh, maybe Chakrapani, who may have been on that level of doing, doing that many horoscopes. Chakrapani does many, many, many horoscopes. He works all, all week long. He's, you know, morning to evening. Well, that's what Gandhi did. But we would start at 9 in the morning and end at 9 or 10 at night, wow. seven days a week. Wow. He only slept four hours a night. And he was, he would just, you know, just there all the time. And um, so in being in that environment where I was, I was the calculator of the horoscopes, you know, I was, I was the computer, you know. The very first thing I did when I got back from London after five years of that was to get a Commodore 64 computer, the very first computer that had, had an astrology program available. And I started, I was just like in heaven, you know. <laughs> Because I was a guy who had to calculate the horoscopes. You have a person that would come, and you know sometimes the person would come and he'd be backed up with people, and the person would say, "Oh, I forgot to tell you, it's a.m. not p.m." All of a sudden, I get back get back to work, you know, and like half an hour later, I'd have a horoscope. But you know, all those horoscopes took you know time to calculate, and so being in that environment, and uh, you know, and doing everything else, like for example. Uh, doing the shopping, going to, you know, driving him around in his car, going to pick him up in the morning, to drop him off in the evening, you know, and then, uh, you know, and then having to cook my food in the back. He had a, he had a dugout kind of cave-like thing. Uh, his, his, his office was in a underground, it was a, a basement um, apartment that was below an Indian restaurant right in the west end of London, right in, the, right in one of the most trendy areas of London. Uh, but he was in a this very really interesting kind of basement apartment, and you, you walk down this very steep flight of stairs, and you would have all these Jain yantras all over the walls. That's one thing about Gandhi that people forget: he wasn't Vedic. He was a Jain. <laughs> yeah, I, a Jain. I and uh, you probably know there are lots of really great Jain astrologers. Some of yeah. some of the best. And some of the best. But, but anyway. Uh, he was a Jain, and so you see all these Jain yantras there. He was also, uh, you know, uh, eclectic, equal opportunity spiritual guy in the sense that uh, he uh, embraced Hinduism and Vedic, the Vedic tradition and Vedic astrology and all that stuff. Uh, but, it, but just being in that office and, um, and you know, sleeping on the floor at night on a, on a pad, you know, uh, that, that experience... This sort of taught me astrology from the from the pores of my skin, you know, not not from that that systematic technique -y thing. I never even thought thought of techniques except for myself. You know, um, Gandhi wasn't a technique teacher, and you, then at one point he decided that he said you know he was, was going to go on a trip to to, to L.A. So he uh, had me drop him off at Heathrow Airport and drop him off. Uh, actually, before I left, he said, he said to me, okay, you're ready. You do the readings while I'm gone. And I went, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, literally, I was just thinking, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, because I, I, I knew less than most of my students do. I'm serious. He said, no, 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 no don't worry, don't worry. To so just look where Jupiter is and say, something good will happen in that house. Look where Saturn is transiting. Say, say you're going through some challenges in that house. It'll be okay, no problem. Oh my God. <laughs> so 
the first, the first, as soon as I got back to the office that evening, I, I thought, oh, okay, he may say that, but I'm not going to do it. You know? So the first person who calls is this lady who said she was going to commit suicide if, un, unless I gave her a reading. Oh, my um, God. And, and it's so it's she happened to me only once. It's happened to me only once. <laughs> <laughs> Months back, actually, yeah. Well, this lady was actually a, a lady who worked for um, um, was it Vogue magazine or something. She was like, okay. That. Anyway, she came in, and uh, I froze. I didn't know what to do. I, I just, you know, you're, when you're looking at a reading when you're first starting out, you don't know what to say. Sometimes I just didn't know what to say, and I sat there for about three minutes, just looking very kind of uncomfortable and nervous. And then all of a sudden, I remember what he said. Look where Saturn is placed. But so I said, Saturn is transiting your seventh house. You must have been having some difficulties with relationships from, you know, whatever, October of whatever, in 1980 to, uh, and it'll end in 19, this was in 1982 when I was doing this. And so it's just going to leave in whatever it was, October of 82. Or and, and it was like two weeks away. And she goes, you're right. She said, I married this guy right at that time, you know, and, and, uh, and it's just been hell ever since. And, and I said, well, well Saturn's going to go away in two weeks. And she goes, oh, thank you. And she went away. And it was like, that was it. You know, beginner's luck. But I just, all I did was I did what he said. But really, it, it was really more um, an experience of just being in the energy of an astrology office, seeing how the whole thing was done, being in his aura the whole time. And... Uh, and then I just absorb so much just from reading and studying and, and then also doing readings. You know, you do a reading, and you, you don't know what to say or you fail at something and it makes you desperate to, to go fix it. You know, you have, you, you have gone through the old grind that, the real grind that uh, the young ones today do not have that uh, opportunity and great luck. You slept on floor in your guru's house. You 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 served him for so many years. Okay, you observed your guru making predictions. You did manual calculations, which is so important for Mercury to get activated. You know, one question that comes in my mind, and I know it's a bit of a silly question: Did you ever get paid for it? For no, <laughs> I knew the answer. No, I knew the answer. <laughs> no pay. What he did start doing after 1982, see, he gave, he actually gave me just like a food stipend, you know, money to go buy food. Okay. And I didn't get like a salary or anything. And, uh, and, you know, I paid my tickets. He took me to India. He took me on uh, about three different pilgrimages, one month long pilgrimages. Um, and he also dropped me off in India for about eight months at one point where I, he had me study study jainism and study study uh vedic astrology and and study a little hindi and you know that sort of thing uh, and so he actually kind of subsidized a lot of my education there and took me on these amazing trips and let me stay in his place and so it was really a res totally i mean i got the better deal for sure but you know even if he hadn't done that i i totally would have been willing to just I do it for free. Nowadays, everybody does it for money. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody is, uh, I mean, also, you know, what, what I wanted to say was, you know, why I like, why I feel you're so lucky is today's youngsters, they want everything systematic. Mm -hmm. Whereas you did not learn the systematic way. Although I, I, I do understand you've been one of the founding members of the American Council of Vedic Astrology and the College of Vedic Astrology, you know, where you, you all have systemized the education. But still, I feel you're more lucky than the new ones, you know, because when you learn things unsystematically, then you have to spend that effort trying to join the puzzles, join the links. Right. And that effort is what makes you much more smarter. I've been dying to ask you one question. You know, because I, I, I know your story. Uh, we've known each other since quite a few years. And of course, I've read your book. And you have been very nice in mentioning some of your spiritual incidents that have happened here in India. You know, you've been fortunate, extremely fortunate to meet 
some rare yogis some mahatmas you conduct tours in india you know so you keep on meeting all these yogis can you tell us some of about some of them you know i would like to hear about their stories uh let's see um the one interesting yogi is hans baba hans baba hans baba and uh, i'm i've met him several times i've gone gone to see him myself and then later on you know i take people to india i'm taking a group to india in, uh, in february and um uh we're going to go see hans baba i've taken groups to see him before and um Hans Baba, you you probably know is yes, I know him. I I thanks to Dr. K. S. Charak, uh, I know him. Right, yeah, Dr. Charak is a, a devotee of him. But anyway, um, Hans Baba was the maybe we can say the foremost disciple of uh, another teacher named Devaraha Baba. Devaraha yes. Baba was famous uh, back in the day. He he used to sit. On a munch, you know, which is a platform on stilts about eight feet high, with a grass hut on the top of the platform, and that's how where he would live. He'd live up there. And he has lived on the banks of the Ganges and in, in this hut. And um, when he died, his foremost disciple, Hans Baba, you know, who was so attached to him, uh, disappeared for a while. And then I guess after about a month later, he came back, and he had this new light in his eye. And uh, he said, "I'm no longer Hans Baba. I'm Devaraha Hans Baba." In other words, he was co-piloting. You know. Okay. So that's the idea. And there's one of the one of the saying one of the aphorisms in the Yoga Sutra says that uh, if a yogi, you know, at the time of his death, uh, you know, wishes for one reason or another to continue his work. He can leave his body and enter the body of his disciple, and um, continue that way. And so, apparently, according to the story, anyway, uh, that's what's going on with Hans Baba. But he's an incredibly powerful uh, teacher. He's the kind of kind of teacher where, for example, um, the 2010 Kumbh Mela, uh, Hans Baba was there, and actually, it may have, it may have been a Kumbh Mela after that, but. Anyway, Hans Baba was there, and a friend of mine who went to it said that the uh, three of the four Shankaracharyas all together went to see him and spent, you know, like several hours with him. Wow! So, so you know, very few people get get really recognized that way. Uh, Shivananda Murthy was another one like that. The Shankaracharya uh, came to visit him as well at his place in Bimini, Putnam. But, but uh, you know. Hans Baba is a uh, is the real deal. You know, he's a he's an authentic, classical sort of Indian yogi. You know, who uh, is naked except for wearing a little deer skin when he stands up. You know, he's um, um, you know just a bright light. But anyway, I met him back in the '90s, and uh, it turns out that I was really I was really sick uh, when I when I met him. Actually. Actually, I, I had come to Delhi because um, I had been um, on a trip, and I was we were putting together a conference. And one of the things I was doing on my trip was was meeting different astrologers. And at that time, um, Vipin, uh, Bipin Bahari, remember him? Yeah. So he was we going to invite. We were inviting him to come to uh, you know to do. The uh, American Council of Vedic Astrology World Symposium. You know, uh, I used to put that on along with Dennis Harness. Dennis Harness and I used to produce that conference, and so I was over there. Uh, basically, um, you know, I was going to interview Bipin Bahari, and I had just been to his house, and I invited him, and he said he'd come, and that was nice. But I had gotten some kind of bug, and I, after I left his house, I ended up. You know, puking on his, well, on his in his yard, you know, outside, his, you know, outside the place, and so I was really sick. And um, so anyway, that that uh, next day, um, uh, a friend of mine came over. He was a, a Vedic 
astrologer and also a Ayurvedic physician. And he said, hey, you know, um, uh, Hans Baba is here. Would you like to go see him? I said, okay. Well, I, was, I was so sick I could hardly get up, but I, since it was Hans Baba, I was willing to go. So we went to this little lot. It was sort of like a vacant lot, you know, where they had um, you know, some trees and just kind of a, 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 like an acre of land. And, and he had this, there was this monch that was built for him there in Delhi. For him, when he visits, he's, even then he sits up on the spot. And so uh, we went up to the place, and we were the only ones there. Um, and uh, for some reason, because he usually is surrounded by lots of people. And, uh, you know, my friend looks, talking to him, and he says, who is he? And, and my friend said, well, he's James Calahari. He he's from the United States, and, and he's sick. And he says, well, I said, what's wrong with him? And he says, well, his stomach, and he's having some problems. And so he said, come over here. So Hans Baba had me come over and stand under his match, and he puts his leg down. And this is a thing that he does with people. He puts he puts his foot on their head, and uh, in putting it on their head, he's channeling Shakti into their you know, into the top of their head. So he was doing this, and uh, while he was doing this, he said, "Okay, now you're going to start feeling warmer." Now it was Jan, it was February, and it was cold in Delhi. And I had a parka on. I also, because I was sick, I had every other piece of clothing I could get on because I was cold. And, but uh, so I, he, he starts channeling, and, he's, and while he's doing this, he's, he's saying, okay. So, and he's chanting. He, he tend to typically just chants the whole time, but he was chanting, uh, are you feeling warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer? And he kept saying this over and over again. And as he did this, I just started to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Pretty soon I got rid of my parka, and then I got rid of my sweater, and then I got rid of my shirt. I was down to my t-shirt and I was just sweating like crazy. Oh my God. And then, and then he was done. And I felt fantastic. <laughs> I was done. What was interesting was that after I met Bipin Bahari, uh, I also went over, uh, my friend took me over to meet um, uh, Jay and Sharma at the same time. Oh, yes. This is the day before I met Hans Baba. And so uh, I went to <laughs> Jay and Sharma, and uh, we were going to meet at this restaurant. It was all set up, and, and I got out of the car. His car pulled up. He got out of the car, walked up to him, and my friend said, Jay and Sharma, this is James Kelleher. Uh, and he said, how do you do, Mr. Kelleher? And I immediately puked on his feet. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm just, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't the best with Nimittas, but he ended up being my, uh, Jyot, my uh, Prashna teacher. Yes. He's one of the best. He's one of the best yeah. Prashna experts. Oh. Yeah. You know, about Hans Baba. <laughs> I was yeah, just let me just say one other thing there. So sure. we went into the, into the restaurant and I was, I, I couldn't sit up, so I was lying down on the bench in uh, the restaurant. I was so sick. And I raised my head and I said, Mr. Sharma, can't you predict when I'm going to get better? And he said, well, I don't have a charger. I said, but yeah, but you know, you know where the planets are in your head. He said, yeah, okay. And so he, he said, he said, you'll be better by tomorrow. And I, I thought to myself, never, because I felt so bad. But then Hans Bob all of a sudden, just out of the blue. Oh my God. So the prediction came true. <laughs> That's good. You know, you know why I feel you're so lucky because uh, you know Hans Baba is uh, once it was a couple of years back, I think six, seven years back or something. I just called up KS Charak for something, and Doctor Charak said, "Oh, I'm in a hurry. I'm just leaving. I'm just on the way to meet uh, Hans Baba." You know. So I just told him, "Okay, I'm transferring right now." Some, I think 3,000 or 5,000 I transferred. I said, please give it to him, you know, because he's a uh, great soul, you know, and uh, they don't have any source of income. You won't believe. I just transferred. You won't believe. I was le much later, many years later, I realized that I was going through a very bad phase of my life at that time. And it changed. It changed miraculously. And now, last two years, I'm again going through a very tough phase of my life, extremely tough from health-wise and many angles. And I've been thinking, 
to send him money you know but somehow it's not happening but today in the morning when i got up i realized okay we have this interview with you and you reminded me of hans baba ah there you go so i am extremely grateful because right after this session i am going to do that thing you know because indian culture is like this we take care of our uh, spiritual yogis you know tell me something you traveled in the himalayas you also know hindi i i do know you know hindi you know i've you forgotten know? about hindi <laughs> okay <laughs> while we were in visakhapatnam i think you and me kind of did converse a bit in hindi you know so seven years back or something we you and me were sitting in that small auto rickshaw crowded four people five people in the auto i think i was sitting on somebody's lap i don't remember now <laughs> you know but i'm very much interested in your travels in the himalayas i do remember way back then in 2010 you were you had kind of hired a this is what you told me you had kind of hired a helicopter to take you on the top of some hill in uh, himalayas to meet yeah, no, no. a particular yogi oh i see what's okay. it yeah oh um it, it wasn't uh to meet a actually Uh, I guess we did. It's it's kind of um, we had a mixture of things at that and during that trip. Uh one of the things we did was we met with uh Teet Maharaj. Sorry? Teet Maharaj. Teet Maharaj. Teet Maharaj. Teet Maharaj was I would say I think it's safe to say while he was alive, he he passed away a couple of years ago. Um but uh, while he was alive, he was it was probably safe to say he was the oldest astrologer in the world by far. He he was a hundred and eighteen years old when he died, or something like that. Oh. Okay. And he had been actually, and, and this is no no joke because he he actually because a lot of people say I'm a hundred and whatever I'm two hundred two hundred years old, but it's just uh, fake. But Sri Maharaj actually was um, in the entourage of the Shankaracharya in the eighteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds, like like eighteen ninety. His, his mother actually gave him at about the age of ten to his to uh, the Shankaracharya's you know school there, and he was he that's how he kind of grew up you know. And he then became a yogi, and he went up in the Himalayas, and he spent a lot of time up in the Himalayas. Uh, and then after he came down, the government he he stayed uh, in a place uh, by Jageshwara. Uh, Jageshwara is up near Nainital. And uh, Jageshwara is. Uh, some people say it's one of the Jyotirlingams, but in any case, it's a it's a very important, powerful spiritual place. And he, and this forest there uh, was given to him by the by the uh, British. They named it the Teet Forest after he was called Teet Maharaj, you know, the Maharaja of the of the forest. And he was just this really you know great yogi that lived there, and he he was an astrologer and. He would, um, you know, he. You should have seen the the almanac he used. You remember those old almanacs that uh, astrologers used to use before computers? You just look up and look it up, and they'd have little charts, and you know, that would be there. So you didn't need to actually calculate a horoscope. You could see kind of a generalized chart, on, you know, every other page or something. He had one of these things, but it was ancient. It was just ancient. And Ayanamsha was different. You know, it wasn't Lahiri Ayanamsha. It was a Old Ayanamsha before Lahiri uh, and all that. So uh, anyway, Teet Maharaj was a uh, was a a, a great uh, a great yogi. I was up there one time, and we were sitting with him in his hut. And uh, my friend and I, uh, Rajiv Tomar, who is a uh, great, great guy who, very close friend of mine also. Yeah, Rajiv, great guy. Yeah, he has a company named Mystical Journeys in India, and he. He handles all my trips in India. He he does all the groundwork, and Rajiv just has this. You know, I guess he's got a little city, and that city is just simply that he can get access to any yogi on the face of the earth. True, you know, he, he, so, true. so true. He's one guy. You you call up this city, any uh, any yogi there, he'll instantly give you the phone number or address, etc. Absolutely. 
and he can get invited. He knows how to get invited. Yeah. You know, but anyway, um, not to get off the subject here, but uh, Rajiv had introduced me to him. We were up at his, at Deep Maharaj's hut up in, uh, up in Jageshwara. And it was really cold, and uh, Teet Maharaj was uh, sitting outside and was just sitting in this really thin cotton, you know, uh, robe. And I again had, and I, I tend to run cold, and so I had uh, my parka and my long underwear and everything on. And we, after about three or four hours of this, I was getting cold even with that on. And finally, I said to him, "How, how do you, how do you stay so warm?" And he said. He said, sit down. And so he has me sit down, you know, cross-legged. And he says, and he starts teaching me, you know, that bastrika, the, the uh, bellows breathing, you know, the solar, you know, uh, breathing. And uh, he said, I once did this, he said, once I was up in the Himalayas, and uh, there was a big snow, and everything got snowed in. And I was up for three weeks up in the mountains with no, uh, no I was completely cut off from food, everything. Uh, and uh, no heat, no electricity, nothing. And he said, I just did that for three weeks and it kept me from freezing to death. Um, so anyway, that was uh, an interesting little sideline on him. He, he was uh, quite an interesting, interesting guy. He would, when I would take, him to take my groups to see him uh, every, every now and then, there was one time where I got him to look at everybody's horoscope. And I just had them all on my, on my computer. And I brought the computer up to him, and I just went through one after the other after the other. And he would just say one thing about each person. And it was so pertinent. It was just the crux of what was going on with that person. We looked at my wife's horoscope, and after about three seconds, he said, he said, see, now my wife, uh, and he didn't know this, my wife it was a gynecological acupuncturist who specialized in fertility. That was her thing. So he looked at my wife's horoscope, and he goes, Anybody she touches will get pregnant. <laughs> God. Oh my God. Yeah. That is real Jyotish. That is real Jyotish. Yeah, yeah. And he did this, he does for everybody in the in the place. I mean every, every single person, the same kind of thing. It was just like a look at it, say one nugget thing that was just absolutely to the point and uh, you know of the of the chart. But anyway, he was he was quite a Quite an interesting guy. But on that trip, though, we, we hired a helicopter to go up to, um, to Keternoth. And I had been up to Keternoth before. Uh, you know what Keternoth is? It's the, the, the Jiva temple. It's, yeah. And um, I'd been up there a couple of times before where, where you hike up. You know, I'd even taken a group up to Keternoth. But after, since I'd already done that, I wanted to go up by helicopter because that was supposed to be a spectacular ride. And man, that was just... That was just the most incredible thing. If you ever have a chance to go to get or not, there's no question. <laughs> Do it by helicopter. It's just, oh, just amazing. Yeah. Uh, James, did you see any uh, miracles like how you uh, did it with Hans Baba, with Teet Baba? Did you see? Teet Maharaj, sorry. Did you see any particular miracles of his yogic power? Uh, not, not in the sense of you know some big miracle. We were up there one time talking to him, and while we were talking to him, this guy came with his wife, and Teet Maharaj, um, you know, basically uh, put him off, and I couldn't believe it. He was being really rude to the guy. He was saying, "Go away." And the guy kept pushing in, and, and we were talking to him, you know, having this little conversation, just Rajiv and I, T. Maharaj, he kept putting it, go away. And finally, he kept doing it, and so finally, T. Maharaj says, okay. And so he's had him sit down, and then he took some rice. He used, he used rice for doing, you ever seen rice astrology before? I, I've done, uh, been Banaras, Nilkan Shastriji, and even in Kerala, we do it. But in Banaras, Nilkan Shastriji does that. Uh, so you know, you know Neil Kanchashastri, Sh Shastri, right? Neil Kanchashastri. Yeah, he's a is he he's a um, uh, what am I going to say? He's a he's a is he uh, a Gujarati guy or no no uh, he's he's a Bengali guy. Bengali, Bengali guy, yes. 
from from your hand he creates your horoscope ah, okay. from your hand he creates your horoscope and he uses <laughs> rice he uses rice to uh, predict if somebody has done black magic on someone so he will do the rice he will do the calculation then he'll hear it he'll speak to it and then he'll say black magic was done on you two years back in september within one and a half months it will be over i have it in recording and incidentally the man met a black magician exactly two years back and from two years back till now he's going through problems so i knew the history and i saw the prediction okay last time when i was in banaras i i saw the i recorded it also on video exact predictions just from the rice but it takes him time around 5 10 minutes it takes him to do that calculation please not sure if it's just, uh, i i i knew a nilakanta uh guy named that who in in varanasi as well but i he didn't do rice so maybe it's the same guy maybe it isn't but okay. anyway uh, this uh pete maharaj was doing doing a, a rice kind of jyotish you know and he was uh he started talking to this guy and then he just he just said uh he said a bunch of stuff to him and then he then he sent him away and then uh and he was brusque you know he was rude he was forceful and then he turned to us and he said that guy he said uh he's he is trying to get his son cured and his son uh murdered somebody and uh, this guy had sent his son to murder his murder somebody out of some kind of jealous th thing and uh he was going through the whole the whole thing uh, which he had him just in two uh just excuse me this is that i told you about my cook just one second sorry sorry james the indians we we the cook is the most costliest item in the world <laughs> sorry please continue so anyway you know this uh this murder had taken place uh and he he knew the mind of this guy uh before the guy had even talked to him and that's why he was trying to push him away because what he was trying to get was a blessing he was trying to get keep maraj to heal his son and he said he gave him the healing but then he just said send him on his way because His, his intentions were so so corrupt yeah so so uh, i mean uh, the guy did admit that his son had murdered somebody i didn't hear that part okay i didn't okay. hear that part this is just teet maharaj telling us this is what happened okay okay so telling, hmm. yogi telling yogi telling would be so which is your most favorite place to in india Kedarnath. Kedarnath. Yeah, Kedarnath is is just a a really great guy. Uh, when we were at Kedarnath, we met um, a uh, Kedarnath Baba. Have you ever heard of him? No. no. Kedarnath Baba was a guy who kept the the duni going at up up. He was a uh, tantric guy, uh, a, a, a you know left-handed tantric agori guy. Okay. Uh, he was a really nice guy, great guy, you know, long matted hair, you know, and all that. But he he basically ha had a uh, a hut that was right ne next to the temple up there uh, where all of the all of the uh tantric gori guys when they would come up, they would um they would stay in this hut because he kept the, the duni as this this uh big log that they keep always burning you know 
it's got a ritual significance yeah. and right but anyway, it's, it was just like this meeting place for all the all these different yogis and people who would come up and you know it was snowing when we were up there and and uh, this guy had walked 14 miles and he was my age you know and he just all he had on was a little wrap you know i mean i, I can't believe he was wasn't frozen to death and he came in you know sat down got a cup of tea you know he just sat there but you know this um he was a he would give medicines to people rajiv took a group across the um, path from um from gungo tree to kedarnath over a 17,000 foot Pass. Rajiv was a uh, was a um, he was a mountaineer in his, uh, yeah. earlier in his life. Yeah. He and Dr. Chark, Dr. Chark, Dr. Chark. he were yeah. Delhi climbing. Yeah. And so Rajiv knew this path, and he took this group of um, uh, of uh, travelers. You know, that were on his trip from Dungo Tree. They walked all the way to Kedarnath, and went over the pass at seventeen thousand feet. A number of them got snow blindness. So they came into Kedarnath and uh, he introduced them to Kedarnath Baba. And Kedarnath Baba is uh, also a healer, a herbalist. And so he got out some, little, some herbs and put some drops in their eyes and immediately they could see. Oh my God. Oh my <laughs> God. You know, you have, uh, have you been to uh, that Orissa, that uh, plate reader? I think you have been. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, that I heard about the copper plate guy from um, um, uh, Swami Shivananda Murti. Okay. Uh, Swami Shivananda Murti, uh, I had been going to see him for many years, and I we were talking, and I was telling him about a Nadi reading that I had gotten. Uh, the astrologer is very accurate. And he said, oh, yes, you know, there are many types of divination systems in India. And then there's the copper plate guy. <laughs> I thought, wow, okay, what's this? You know, something new, I haven't heard of this. He says, he said, yeah, he's this guy who reads, who reads your um, chart from a copper plate, you know, he he, or at least he tells you, answers your questions from a copper plate. It's copper plate, what do you mean? He says, he, he says, the answer to your question comes on a copper plate. In, in, a, in Sanskrit, you know, in Sanskrit letters. I just could not believe this. And so I said, well, can you tell me how to get there? And he said, um, sure. But he said, my problem is the guy that told me about this is my student. And he's, uh, he's the vice president of India. <laughs> and so, you know, that time, this was back when, you know, Vice President of India had just you just become vice president. And apparently, Shivanandamurti said that this copper plate guy had predicted that he would become vice president on a certain day. And um, but the problem was he wasn't running for vice president. Okay. There was no election, nothing coming up. And it turned out that it happened. He was just appointed on that day out of the blue. Oh my God! And this this had come on the copper plate, and he had, it had told him that this was going to happen. I said, well, I'd like to meet him, but, you know, I didn't want him to call up the vice president of India. He said, oh, no, I'll, I'll ask him. And I thought, <laughs> I thought right, you're going to ask, you're going to say, oh, um, James Keller wants to know, right? <laughs> but anyway, so about, I think it was about five years later, um, I was in his place, and he says, uh, all, all of a sudden, out of the blue, he, the phone rang, and he said, you're going to get your, your wish. I said, what do you mean? He says, the vice president's secretary has come down to visit. He'll be here tomorrow, and I'll ask him for you. He, can, he remembered this after five years. And so the secretary came down, and um, so he had asked me to do, his read, do a reading for him while he was there. I said, no, I won't do that because this is even on Marti's place. You talk to him. You know, I don't want to do anything like that here. And, uh, but we happened to be on the same plane together on the way out. And so he invited me to come up to his, up to the vice president's mansion and do a reading for him because he lived uh, next to the mansion and the, the house next to the mansion. And so he invited me up to dinner and his wife made dinner and I, I gave him a reading. And then he, he called his brother, who was the minister of tourism in Orissa, and 
he had been down to see him many times, and the vice president's secretary had been down to see him many times. So he, he basically sent me to his brother, and his brother took me down uh, to, see the, to see him. But the thing was, um, I was surprised because I, I didn't know, I didn't expect, uh, I mean, I thought I was going to go in and just you know, things would come on the plate, you know, I'd ask a question and things would come on the plate. What I didn't expect was that not only does your question get answered, but he also, the question itself comes on the plate. You don't even have to ask him. Yeah. Well, so yeah. as I went down, I was in the car and I was thinking, what am I going to ask? I thought, well, yeah, I'm not really interested in anything. I mean, you know, I'm an astrologer, so I've been doing a lot of this for a long time. So I, at this point in my life, I'm not, I'm not really, I've kind of got my big questions answered. But, you know, I had worked out my own longevity, and I, I had uh, an idea of what I thought my age of death would be. I had two or three other astrologers say something, and Shiva Nanamarty had said something. Okay? And so we had, I had... Um, several things that were going there. And so uh, I had a question because a couple of them differed. And so um, I thought, well, I'll ask him my longevity. It's kind of an academic question. Then secondly, I thought, well, I'll ask him about how my work will go. Uh, but, you know, just not really thinking about that much. And then I thought, well, I'll ask him a question for my wife because my wife, you know how that is. You got to ask a question for your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and so... So anyway, I I uh, I thought, but you know, I'll ask him. I'll ask about her investments because she had a couple of investments that she was interested in. But really, what I was curious about was her health. She was having some symptoms. She was getting dizzy. She was kind of feeling tired. She had, and it was hard to tell what was going on with her. And uh, but I, I thought, no, no, don't ask that. I don't know who this guy is. I don't want him to give me some big dark you know, prediction, uh, you know, and not knowing exactly who he is. So I'm just going to leave that one. Out. So I went in. And the way it works, he says, take this piece of chalk. And I took the piece of chalk and I put it on my forehead. And, and he starts to think of the question. And then after you're done thinking of it, you're supposed to take the chalk. And he has this stack of copper plates. Now, he had shown me the copper plates before, beforehand so I could see that they did not have anything on them. They're blank. They look like rulers, you know, they were like long strips of copper in the stack. And so I took, I was supposed to take the, after thinking of the question, I was supposed to take the chalk and separate the rulers in a, um, you know, like, like cutting a deck of cards, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Expose one of the plates. So he takes the plate that was exposed and he starts to read and he goes, uh, and he goes, well, first he, show, he takes it up to the light and he shows me that it's got these finely etched letters on it now okay, in Sanskrit. And so uh, then he goes, you have three questions. Uh, one is about your work. A second is an academic question. And the third is about your wife. But about your wife, you have two questions. One is about her, her investments, but the other is about her health. And I thought, oh, my God, don't tell me this. <laughs> and so, so he goes to the three that I didn't, I didn't have any charge on whatsoever. I really didn't care about it. He answers in one sentence each. Then about my wife, he answers it in complete detail. He says she gets dizzy, she's tired. She, he, he mentioned at least four symptoms. That she had. And then afterwards he says, I've got an Ayurvedic text here, and the copper plate has mentioned for me to read a certain page of that Ayurvedic text. It was also on palm leaf. And um, he said, would you like me to do that? And I said, yes. And so he, he read there and he gave all these Ayurvedic prescriptions. Um, now, she got better before we could even use the, the prescriptions. So I don't know what the prescriptions were, but th that was one of those experiences where, you know, I mean, I know that when people come to an astrologer, no matter who the astrologer is, you know, Every now and then the person will just go away thinking, wow, you know, that astrologer, wow, that's magic, you know. Well, so you're an astrologer, you're used to kind of people doing that, and, and you know, you're on the other side of it, so it's not such a magic thing as much, you know. But, but you know, this was me having that experience with somebody else. After I'd already kind of seen a lot of different types of people in India, it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting experience. 
that's great ladies and gentlemen we're going to continue this mystical journey with james kalaha in part 2 thank you so much uh, james for your valuable time i appreciate so much and i have thoroughly and i'm quite sure our audience would love this session with you okay all right thanks all right any else great thank you Thank you.